forget as we hit continue to get this um, party started and recorded. I'm Alejandra Sotelo Solis, um, Chair for the Public Safety Committee here uh, at Sandag, and welcome to the May 21st Sandag Public Safety Committee meeting. Before we get started, I would like to ask our interpreter, Mr. Andy Marquez, to introduce himself and walk through how to access our interpretation services for today's meeting. Andy? Thank you so much. Muy buenos días y bienvenidos a todos nosotros aquí presentes. Si les gustaría interpretación en español, en la parte inferior de la pantalla podrá usted uh, poder solicitar su interpretación en su idioma. So thank you everyone and welcome. If you need interpretation in, in a different language other than English, uh, you can go ahead and choose it at the sphere or the earth or the world on the bottom part of your uh, monitor there and you'll be able to choose your language. Otherwise, just remain in the main language. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, so why don't we get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. If we could put our right hand over our heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Well done. So uh, thank you again, everybody for joining us. Before we really jump right into the meeting, I will ask our clerk to confirm that we do have a quorum. Francesca? Thank you, Chair, we do have a quorum. Outstanding. I'd like to remind the members um, and uh, those of the public of our process for both member and public comment. Uh, the committee members will be using their camera and we will take uh, live public comments. Members are asked to turn on their camera when they have a comment or a question, and then I'll recognize you. And if you are a member of the public and would like to speak on an item, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom toolbar and unmute yourself when you are called on. If you are calling into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone if you would like to comment on an item. So, uh, with that, we move on to item number one. It's the approval of meeting minutes. If a member of the public would like to make a comment, please raise your hand now. Terry, I don't see any hands from the public. Great. Uh, seeing none, um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the meeting minutes for- um, I will so move, question. Chair. This is Raul Campillo. Uh, motion for member Campillo. Do I hear a second? Second from second. Scrub. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Ooh, uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to give it to Council Member Musgrove, but I saw his camera light up first. So we have a motion uh, for member Campillo, seconded for member Musgrove. Any discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Thank you, Chair. For the County Chief Sheriff's Association CA, Chief K. Here. Uh, Chief, could you provide a vote on the minutes, please? I apologize. Um, approve. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, County Chief Sheriff's Association seat B, Chief Varso. Aye. Thank you. For the City of San Diego, Council Member Campillo. Vote aye. Thank you. The County of San Diego is absent. For uh, the San Diego County District Attorney's Office is also absent. For East County, Council Member Goble? Aye. Thank you. For the Regional Fire Emergency Medical Services, Chief Vote? Aye. Thank you. For North County Coastal Chief, or I'm sorry, Council Member Blackburn? Blackburn, aye. Give you a new job there. Sorry about that. Uh, for North County Inland, Council Member Musgrove? Musgrove, aye. Thank you. Uh, the San Diego Police Department is absent. The San Diego County Ch Sheriff's Department is absent. Um, no, oh, um, Sheriff's, Department is, Sheriff's yeah. Department is here. And Maya we also Paul. have Paul Colin Connolly from the San Diego Police Department, Francesca. Yeah. My apologies. I'll have the, the Sheriff's Department is here and I vote aye. Yep. Paul Connolly is here for SDPD, aye. Thank you very much for those corrections. My apologies. I have aye for both jurisdictions. And for South County, Chair Sotelo Solis? Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you very much. And that does pass with those members present. Thank you so much. We now go uh, on to item three, the executive director's report. And um, 
I believe Director Krenn is here. Yes, I am, uh, Mayor uh, Stola Salis. Uh, good afternoon. Um, members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. A few things of importance to inform you about. Uh, the first one is I have some great news to share about our beloved former Arjus Director Pam Scanlon, who passed uh, away last year. For those of you he, who may not have had the pleasure of knowing her, uh, Pam led Arjus as director for more than two decades. I have the honor of knowing her uh, for about a year from those two decades. As uh, uh, she was a trailblazer in the field. Uh, many of you met her, know her, work with her. As we announced about a year ago, the International Association of Chiefs of Police Criminal Justice Information System Committee created an annual award in honor of Pam. I'm pleased to share that the first Pamela Scanlon Excellent in Criminal Justice Information Sharing Award was given at the International Association of Chiefs of Police Tech Conference earlier this week. This year recipient is from Yemen. Mohammed Abdullah Hussein Ahli of the Dubai Police Department was recognized for taking down a multinational gang syndicate through information sharing. This award honors those who have dedicated their public safety careers to the advancement of criminal justice information sharing. What a great way to honor the amazing impact of Pam. Uh, her work uh, being honored around the world. And so I, I just want you to know, and especially uh, this committee worked with Pam, that we're honored at Sandag to have a small part uh, of this amazing trailblazer that uh, we dearly loved. A couple of other <coughs> items um, on the state right uh, 67 Fiber deployment. Uh, Speaking of trailblazers, uh, I want you to, to, to know about how our team has taken a, a crazy idea and worked hard in two months to make, uh, to, to turn that crazy idea into action. Uh, our team at Sandag led by Antoinette Meyer uh, in collaboration with the County of San Diego and Caltrans, we secured uh, uh, funding uh, to uh, uh, lay 18 miles worth of uh, broadband on the 67 uh, as Caltrans is uh, trying to uh, re uh, repair pavement. Uh, this is the dig once policy. So we were digging anyway. So we, we went quickly and, and, and said, let us get the money to do brown. What does that mean? That means 225,000 residents of our rural areas is gonna have access to a broadband that they didn't have before. That is what bridging the digital divide is. That's why our second vice chair, who's your chair, Stolasis, knows very well that we, uh, the board adopted an equity statement. And the only measure of our success toward that equity statement is tangible actions. That's an action that we took really quickly. And again, I wanna thank the county for their $1.4 million and Caltrans for working with us to do that. As many of you heard us before talk about the Central Mobility Hub and working with the United States Navy on a potential site for the Central Mobility Hub and connecting to the airport. I uh, just wanna to report to you that this work is progressing. Uh, a few weeks ago, we released the notice of preparation this is a significant step toward declaring this project environmentally. Uh, I can tell you that this project is transformational. It is uh, about not only transportation, but it's about economic development, about environmental sustainability. And I will be talking to you more as we move forward. Uh, one of the five big moves in the regional transportation plan, depending where you stand in this, uh, I am happy to report to you that in two hours, uh, that draft plan uh, will be mailed out to the public and to all of you. We're releasing the draft plan officially next week. Um, this is a, a work of two years of an amazing team here at Sandag. I truly, I am, couldn't be prouder 
uh, couldn't be more honored to work with such a talented group of people that uh, I think the five big moves is about reimagining the future of transportation system in San Diego. It's uh, about allowing the 3.4 million San Diegans to dream and about asking our leaders to make sure these dreams are achieved. Today, we just concluded the second uh, workshop that we held uh, with our board and policy committee and stakeholders. Um, I feel uh, very strongly that uh, even though it's a lot of work to put workshop together, that these workshops allowed our especially board members, policy committee members, stakeholders to ask questions, to make comments before the release of the draft plan next week. If you need any further information on the plan, please visit our website or you can ask us directly. <clears throat> I just want you to you know, put a plug here. I said about our staff, uh, Colleen Clemenson, the, the amazing planning director, Ray Major, uh, the chief economist and their teams. Uh, they just did an amazing job like they do. And I think uh, our second vice chair uh, and Mr. Campi will, will attest when they hear their presentation. But today, uh, they laid it out there. They laid the system for each subregion, why the system is relevant, why it's worth the money we're investing it in. And so stay tuned for uh, many more discussion until we adopt this plan uh, at the end of this year. Uh, briefly on the Delmar Bluff, as you know, uh, the February 28th collapse prompted us to move quickly, get funding, and uh, start the repair of the bluff. That, that work will be completed by July. Uh, so it's uh, safe for our trains to operate. Uh, but as I said before, uh, this is, uh, I think, will be one of the last repair we do. We need to move this bluff inland. Uh, and any uh, expenditure of money on temporary solution is a wasted money, frankly, uh, because you, know, you can fight nature. Nature will win at the end of the day. So stay tuned for the plus. And finally, the largest infrastructure project uh, uh, in San Diego's history, uh, which we call the mid-cost, that um, uh, is gonna link the border to UCSD. Uh, this will be open uh, later this year. Um, it will be, uh, we will be done with the construction, then we'll turn it to MTS, our transit agency to operate. Uh, I believe this will be the highest, um, probably light rail transit ridership in the country. And this is, will offer a one seat ride from the border all the way to the university. It will be uh, in terms of time shorter to take it than a drive on the five during the peak period, a great accomplishment. Uh, and I wanna mention something about uh, the return to the office. I know it's in the mind of uh, many of us uh, our governor uh, indicated that he's going to fully open the state June 15th in a preparation for that. Uh, we uh, made it clear to our staff uh, that we will be uh, coming back to the office uh, gradually, but uh, the, the, we will all be back in the office by September 7th, starting the gradual return June 15th. Uh, I also uh, will be informing the, our board members um, and the leadership that we will be back live for the first board meeting in September uh, to be in, in the office. Uh, in August, we are uh, dark, but uh, that's the plan. And that concludes my report, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. You're muted, Chair. I can't hear you either, Chair. Thanks. Now. You can ask any questions if you have any questions while the uh, the chair is coming back online. Executive Director, I was going to ask a quick question. What what day exactly is the uh, the draft report coming out? 
28th. It will be mailed today, but the uh, actual release is uh, next week, next Friday, the 28th of May. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you and all the hard work you've put into it. Uh, obviously, we've had discussions about many aspects of it and how it's going to really transform our region economically, uh, socially, and just a major upgrade, in my opinion, to uh, what we have today to get to where we want to be in our future. So thank you for your vision on that and look forward to supporting that at a transportation committee and beyond and out in the public as well, because I, I really think uh, if with knowing all the details and the interconnecting components, uh, I think that people will realize it's a it's a great investment. And uh, ultimately, with how much growth we're going to see in our region in the future, truly, truly needed. So thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership, uh, being a vice chair of the Transportation Committee and, and all the work you did so far. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Campillo. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Technology. Don't we love it? Um, all right, thank you again. And what I was, what I was, you know, so eloquently saying, which I don't know if I can repeat it because it was just so well said and while I was muted. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just want to thank the staff uh, for um, again talking about from the bluffs all the way to the big five moves. And again, today's presentation uh, was a repeat of what we had on Monday. But again, it's about access to the information for my colleagues as board members. Um, so we can really answer those questions, and I and I appreciated the, the the candor and true detail that staff went into uh, this past um, week uh, with each one of my colleagues and myself because I know I had uh, four compound questions, and uh, I think it's that type of uh, detail that we need to have answers to. Uh, so once it is presented to us as a board, we can really move forward um, with the regional plan, and um, you know future projects in each of our sub-regions, uh, making uh, the bigger whole uh, more successful. So with that, I have uh, two cameras on, Mr. Boyd. I have your camera on, if you have a question for Mr. Krata. No. Oh, okay, no. Okay, Mr. Collins, any questions for Mr. Krata? Mr. Ray, uh, Ramers, question for Mr. Krata? No, okay. So um, we were just saying, if you had your camera on, then I meant you had a question, but it's okay if you want to be seen. I now know that if you wave your hands in the air, um, that maybe you have a question. Okay, so seeing no additional questions from members of the committee, we now move to questions or comments from members of the public. Chair, there are no hands up from the public. Fabulous. Thank you again, um, uh, Hassan. We appreciate you being here. And we now move on to item four, which is an uh, update from the um, uh, San Diego County Fire Chiefs Association. Chief Boyd. Thank you. Good afternoon. So the San Diego County Fire Chiefs Association held a meeting on May the 6th, and I'll share a few of the highlights. Um, we elected the 2021-2022 slate of officers, which is a repeat of last year. So I will be continuing um, on this committee as the president of the association. Um, we will be having, and this is kind of exciting, our installation lunch for um, officers on June 3rd in person. Um, and and we're, uh, we're very excited about getting back to a little bit more uh, normalcy, like, like everybody else is with, with meetings. And I'm looking forward to the day we can Get together on this committee as well in person too. Um, we heard a presentation from County OES uh, about the um, revision that's taking place. Uh, it's going to be about a nine to ten month process to revise the San Diego County Emergency Operations Plan and of interest to the County Fire Chiefs are Annex B, the Fire Rescue Mutual Aid Plan, and Annex D, the Mass Casualty Incident Plan. We had a very informative presentation from the state fire marshal's office about two pieces of legislation that were signed into law, AB 2911, which is uh, indicates that in uh, state responsibility area and local responsibility area in the very high fire hazard zones, uh, we need to report existing subdivisions um, that do not have secondary access. That's existing subdivisions greater than 30 homes uh, to the state fire marshal's office again by July 1st. And also AB 38, which requires that any sale of real estate in SRA or in local responsibility area in very high fire hazard severity zones 
uh, they have to pass a defensible space inspection. So that's a new process or a new requirement, I should say, for transactions in real estate. Um, so fire agencies, both uh, state and local government, will be uh, will be making sure that those things are accomplished as well. Uh, on on the 13th of this month, the San Diego County Fire uh, Chiefs held an operations forum preparation for the upcoming fire season. And I will give you some of those highlights. Um, it is a very dry year so far. Um, last year was the warmest on record. I think we all know how, by how much our air conditioning was running last year. Uh, 2021 will be a little bit warmer than normal, but it's not predicted to be as warm as last year. Um, there should be uh, normal um, monsoons, uh, summer storms to perhaps bring a little bit of participation. But overall, we should expect a very dry summer. Uh, right now, the fuels, the brush, the grass is very much drier than normal. And to give a perspective on, on fire season and what we're gearing up for, uh, from January to May in 2020, um, there were 1,554 fires for 2,600 acres. And so far in 2021, that same time period, there have been 2,400 fires and 14,700 acres burned. So that's a little bit less than double the amount of fires in the same time period, but over seven times the acres burned. Uh, and that's just an indication of, of how unusually dry the fuels are that are out there. Um, so 2021 is setting up to be another busy year for us. Um, it's too soon to predict the biggest factor uh, for Southern California and San Diego County, and that's the Santa Ana winds. So that is the end of my report. Great, thank you so much, Chief. I, uh, I look forward to seeing folks in person as well. I, um, how many folks are, I guess, are going to be um, installed? How, how big is the board or, or how does it work? Well, our, our executive board has uh, five members, um, but then on, in the Fire Chiefs Association, there are sections, uh, fire prevention officers, the operations uh, chiefs, the training chiefs, et cetera. So there's seven different sections and they each have a board as well. Uh, so um, quite a few will be, will be installed that day. Great, well, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from members of the public there, Ms. Clerk? No, Chair, no hands from the public. Seeing none, are there any um, comments from uh, the PSC members? Seeing none, this was for information only. We are now moving on to item five. Uh, Ms. Sandy Keaton is presenting on item five, new grant funding for the criminal justice uh, research. And no. Sandy. Yeah. I'm out. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm glad to be back here again this year, sharing, sharing some exciting news about additional funding that we have recently received. As part of our criminal justice clearinghouse, we seek grants to support public safety initiatives and the needs of the region. And at the end of 2020, we asked PSC leadership for permission to partner on three California Board of State and Community Corrections, also known as BSCC. Their Proposition 64 public health and safety grant applications that were submitted by three member agencies, Chula Vista, San Diego Police, and San Diego, the city of San Diego, and La Mesa. Our own Dr. Burke actually assumed the lead in writing these grants, and we were notified that all three were awarded, bringing around $3 million into the region. I'm here today to inform the committee of the need to amend our fiscal year 21 and now also our fiscal year 22 budget to reflect this new funding. The fiscal year 22 amendment is because we received notification after the budget went to the board for approval. Just little background um, with the, prop, the passage of Prop 64 in November 2016, California voters to approve legal recreational use for marijuana for individuals 21 years of age and younger. Um, the three member agencies awarded, um, La Mesa, Chula Vista, and San Diego, um, will each have um, their own implementation plan. However, overall, the plan in general is to use the funds to provide prevention and or intervention services to youth and families regarding marijuana use and harm, and also to fund law enforcement and code enforcement activities of licensed businesses. SANDAG will conduct a process and impact evaluation to measure if the projects were implemented as designed and to what effect. This is an information item only to inform the Public Safety Committee of an amendment to our FY 2021 budget um, um, for $30,000 to start the implementation um, and evaluation activities um, the, on these multi-year grants. Thank you. What, thank you so much, Sandy. Well, I, I would definitely, um, 
be all for and i'm all for accepting money way to go dr <laughs> berg for yeah. you know anytime we can add zeros to our, our our coffers it's definitely a very positive thing uh, especially as we all move towards getting more information out uh, regarding cannabis um, and um, you know with the research that you're going to be doing so with that i uh, am um, this is for information only yes. but i know that you said that we so with regards to just acceptance uh, we don't need a motion for this i know it's it just as information mm -hmm. but i just want to make sure correct it's just information only okay all right, I guess since we did the motion earlier to yeah. our last meeting. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. We now move on to, oh, wait, 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 before we move on. Are there any questions or comments from members of the public? No, thank you, Chair. There are no hands from the public. Um, members of the PSC, I see Mr. Campillo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Sandy, and great work. Uh, quick question for you, noticing the funds. Uh, have many uses, uh, particularly providing prevention and or intervention to youth at risk for substance abuse. My question is, uh, what is the, the termination or matrix or formula that we use to assess uh, if a, a youth is at risk for substance abuse as it relates to this particular funding? Right, and each each um, member agency is gonna do it slightly different. In Chula Vista, we are working with South Bay Community Services and they actually have their own assessment that they use, it's called the Family Wellbeings Assessment. So they will be looking at that when they meet with individuals. Um, and then, uh, so that'll be dependent upon that, that assessment. And then we're also looking at to provide services to youth who are kind of just at risk. And given what we know about um, marijuana use and um, the increased attitude that it's okay in use, um, so targeting areas where um, youth are just kind of at risk to being exposed to it. Um, and then if there is an identification um, of a youth of needing more services, then those referrals will be made. Understood. So is that like law enforcement officers through various programs in the different municipalities being at like a particular park that might be near a dispensary or oh, something like that? Okay. No, it actually, we're actually, the, the, there's um, partnering with community-based organizations who this is their area of expertise. Understood. So okay. the, the, you'll be working with professionals who are able to, who work with youth. Good. Okay. Excellent. Can I, just, can I just add one thing, Sandy, for the city yeah. of San Diego, um, the money is going um, with StarPow. So we'll be working very closely with StarPow, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're familiar with. Very good. Nope. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And, great and question. Great work again, Sandy. Thank you so much, Member Campillo. Uh, any other questions? members of the committee. Seeing none, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burke and team for your work on this. And we will gladly accept the $30,000 uh, on behalf of the members of um, the committee. So thank you for that. Thanks again, Sandy. Okay, we now move on to item six. Um, it is the COVID-19 vaccine distribution in the San Diego region. Uh, Dr. Dr. Christian Ramers will present first, and if possible, let's hold the questions to the end of the three presentations. Um, however, we are fluid, but you know it gives them the the keeps their train of thought going. And so, thank you, Mr. Ramers. Um, and we have Fire Chief Michael Cauldron uh, from the City of Carlsbad, as well as Dr. Tim Collins from Scripps Green Hospital. So, with that, I will open it up to Mr. Uh, Dr. Christian Reimers. Thank you so much, Mayor, and it's great to be with all you uh, distinguished guests. I think uh, somebody will be advancing the slides for me, is that right? Yes, sir. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, my goal here is to just take less than 10 minutes to provide a general overview of what we've learned over the last year for COVID, for everybody's benefit. Um, a lot of alternative facts kind of floating around out there and a lot of misunderstanding of what this disease is, but we really know quite a bit about it now. The first being how it's transmitted. So early on, you'll probably remember uh, bleaching your groceries as they came home and your mail and all that stuff. It's not really that necessary because of the three mechanisms of transmission being aerosols, droplets, and contacts. It looks like droplets are really the most important. And that's the kind of thing that occurs within three to six feet of another person. When you're talking or breathing or singing, those droplets come out of your respiratory tract and they can have COVID in them. Uh, in terms of uh, them falling down on a table or on a door handle, that type of thing, it looks like that's a very uncommon way that COVID is transmitted, which is different than, in, than flu, than influenza, but COVID is a different virus. 
it looks like the one in 10,000 cases are probably caused by, by contact, whereas the, the vast majority are from droplets being nearby. And then aerosols have recently been recognized uh, as being an important, uh, pr probably not very common, but still important way that the disease can be transmitted. That's where things sort of down, you know, 20, 30 feet away in the same room in a place with poor ventilation, uh, even if you're not within six feet of somebody, um, can, uh, uh, can tra transmit the disease. Next slide, please. Uh, and you can advance just one more time. So just the, I'm not gonna get too much into the clinical medicine of this, but I wanna show this just because the timeline is really tricky for us because people think of things in 24 hour news cycles. And this is a disease where it really takes two weeks or so to get you sick enough to be in the hospital. And then it takes about a month to kill somebody, uh, the COVID-19 COVID virus. So there's this early phase we call the viral phase where people are very infectious. You're actually infectious before you even develop symptoms most of the time. And then over the next sort of two weeks is when people generally get sick and end up being in the hospital and their lungs fill with fluid. And that's sort of when, when people really need to be um, uh, in the hospital. But the numbers we see from day to day lag by about two weeks from what's actually happening. So we had this thing in the summer where, where we'd reopen and then things would be fine. Cases didn't hit until two weeks later. So it was really hard to respond to. Next slide, please. Um, the global situation is really pretty awful still with COVID-19. We, we, um, we have the luxury of having great vaccines and lots of them and a public which is generally willing to get a vaccine. But if you look at these numbers, this is from the WHO from different regions around the world. Um, what's going on in India is absolutely tragic. Um, if you fast forward just one, I believe it'll animate the bottom. Yeah, so, so this is India. The cases are in red here and the deaths are in gray. It's as bad as it's ever been. They're losing 4,000 people a day to COVID, which is probably an underestimate. And I was in India two years ago. It's just about 20 hours away by plane. Um, so, you know, uh, depending on our travel policies, people could still bring this right back in. And then also Latin America is, is really heavily hit by COVID. Uh, in the top five, in terms of cases and deaths, we have Argentina, Colombia, and then possibly Mexico as well. Um, so, so not uh, past the pandemic by any means. And globally, uh, I think less than 5% of the world has been vaccinated because most lower and middle income countries have no access to vaccines uh, that we have here and generally take for granted. Next slide, please. US is doing quite well though. Uh, things have kind of calmed down except for little pockets. Uh, we still have about 600 deaths a day or so, and we still have about 30,000 people in the hospital per day. You could advance uh, three times for me. We'll bring in the other panels there. Uh, next slide, and then two more. Okay, great. So the top left is our cases, and you can see the December to January period was quite awful, uh, and we've had a nice decline in cases. We're still not really lower than it was at the beginning of the summer. Uh, same with deaths. We have deaths that are about 600 a day in our country. Hospitalizations, that number still is close to 40,000. So there's still about 40,000 people in the hospital in the U.S. And advance one more time, please. Great. Uh, how are we doing in terms of California? Well, we're actually at the bottom of the list. So California has the lowest case rate in the country right now. This is a, I just checked this uh, uh, yesterday and we're now tied with Oklahoma for the lowest case rate in the, in the country, which is interesting. And I think the public health measures we've taken have really paid off. Um, but there's some, some things that are kind of paradoxical. For example, we also have the lowest rate of in-person school attendance. Uh, which a lot of superintendents are kind of uh, uh, scratching their heads about. If we have such great low case rates, um, maybe we're a little too cautious in terms of returning to school. Um, but we do have uh, you know, a lot of population, a lot of people have died in California. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about masks. So there's a lot of controversy about masks. There really is no question about the science anymore. Masks work. I told you that this disease is passed by droplets and by aerosols. Masks work incredibly well for both of those things. Um, and in terms of mask mandates, which we can talk about in the, in the Q&A a little bit later, uh, advance one slide, please. In places where mask mandates have been implemented, case rates go down, period. There's, I could cite 10, 15, 20 other studies that show this. Panel A here is what happened in uh, New York, uh, where we had New York City a face covering in that heavy blue line. Cases immediately went down, and this is before a vaccine was even developed. Whereas in panel B, this is kind of the rest of the country, case rates basically stayed the same. So, there is no debate about it. Masks work, and they work very well. In a population that has very high vaccination rates, masks become a little bit less necessary. Um, but I'll tell you that in healthcare settings and in high-risk settings uh, like prisons, uh, masks are still going to be um, warranted for a while because we're worried about kind of super spreader events. And they're just one of the most effective tools we have right up there with vaccines. 
Next slide, please. Okay, we can go one more. Speaking of vaccines, I'll just quickly go through this. There's a lot of thought that the vaccines were approved too quickly and people are uncertain about them. This is the detailed and rigorous process that we use to approve any vaccine in the US throughout history. And we followed essentially the exact same playbook. We have phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials that happen in thousands of people. These vaccines were approved in, in some of the biggest trials we've ever had, 30 to 40,000 people. We have a rigorous and transparent review by the FDA advisory committee, a rigorous and transparent review by the CDC advisory committee, and these vaccines were authorized. People say, well, it's not full approval. Well, that's coming soon. Give it another couple of months and we'll have full FDA approval. Um, the processes were exactly the same. So things were not rushed. All the processes that, were, um, that we usually use were passed. In the regular manner, what was really cut was all the red tape. Um, and then waiting for one process to finish before starting the next process, we did things um, in parallel with the vaccines. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. We now have three that are approved, um, Pfizer, Moderna, and, and J and J or Johnson and Johnson, also called Yenton, that I'm sure you've heard about unless you've been under a rock for the last year. Um, the Pfizer is a 12 years and above, Moderna 18 years and above, and Janssen is 18 years and above, but the other two are probably going to get down to 12 years very soon. Really critical uh, as, as we have more kids returning to in-person school to get as many vaccinated as possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then advance one more. Um, the reason that we're able to open up by June 15th in California, the reason cases are plummeting in the US is absolutely due to vaccination, especially on the bottom of this table on the top on the right hand side. Our seniors who are the most vulnerable to get sick and die are almost completely protected from vaccination. 85% of them have gotten a first dose of the vaccine and 73% fully protected. As a population on a whole, we're about 50%, which I would much rather be closer to 75 but we're having amazing benefits already from these vaccines. They've been shown to be incredibly safe. The numbers here, 150 million doses of Pfizer already given, 120 million doses of Moderna. And any safety concerns that you might have are just not showing up. The CDC is rigorously monitoring these things. Um, and there are a few rare things. We've talked about blood clots with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but by and large, incredibly safe vaccines. And they've really saved us uh, this time. And California is above 50% vaccinated as well. Next slide, please. And here's San Diego's numbers. Um, it's a little tough because you can use different denominators and kind of massage the numbers to make them look better. Uh, but recently, this is from May 17th, I have a figure that of the goal that the county set out, we're close to 90%. Uh, that goal is only three quarters of adults. And I would rather have a sort of a better goal, uh, basically everybody above age 12. If you cut the numbers that way, we're still only around 50%. So a long way to go. It's often been said that the first 50% are the easiest because everybody's waiting in line for hours at Petco Park and everything. Now this is happening on individual decisions, discussions with people that are still a little bit hesitant and have heard some crazy rumor from their cousin about microchips or something like that. Um, we just need to get those individuals vaccinated to get as close to a 75% number as we can. One additional point I wanted to make here is on the top left, which is when you talk about socioeconomic status, it is quite striking to me that if you break people down into quartiles of the richest in green here and the poorest in blue, the vaccination rates are consistently and all through the entire time we've been vaccinating, higher for the richer folks, lower for the poorer folks. Not even crossing at any single point, despite all the efforts that the county has been doing. Um, this is the, the crushing power of social determinants of health. Uh, showing that, that people that are richer have, have better access to these life-saving interventions, even if their risk of getting it is gonna be far lower than the poor people in our county. Uh, so that's a pretty good example of, of social determinants of health there. Next slide, I think this might be close to my last. So yeah, so this is my daughter who's 13 and proudly went and got her Pfizer vaccine to kind of increase awareness and then uh, got to talk to Artie Ojeda right afterwards. Um, so this vaccine is safe. I wouldn't have gotten it myself in December and January or subjected my family to it um, if, if I didn't believe in it and, and really believe the science that this is gonna be what is and has brought us out of this terrible pandemic. So I'm gonna stop there. Outstanding, thank you so much. Very proud of your daughter. What is her first name? Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte, outstanding Miss Charlotte. We appreciate you for being that example for your peers as well. Um, thank you, you're setting a great example there, Dr. Ramers. Um, we now go to, um, and I just want to make sure that was your last slide. That was it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. We will have questions for you, so please stand by. Uh, next, we have Fire Chief Michael Calder, uh, Calderwood from Carlsbad, the city of Carlsbad. 
Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, give me a moment to share my screen. Okay, I'm just confirming you can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Okay, so hello, yes, my name is Mike Calderwood. I'm the fire chief for Carlsbad Fire Department and serve as the San Diego County Operational Area Coordinator for all fire rescue departments within the county. We have with us today, Deputy Chief Jason Malnerich from Cal Fire County Fire and Deputy Chief Chris Heiser from San Diego Fire Rescue to answer any specific questions and for discussion at the end of the presentation. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the vaccination process for COVID-19 as it pertains to the fire agencies in San Diego County. As was the case with many things throughout the entire pandemic, the vaccine planning, delivery, and distribution was a moving target, but we, the fire service, collectively navigated the process in partnership with County Public Health to provide distribution of Pfizer, Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Let me start with a little bit of background information. In order to receive delivery of, store, transport, and administer the vaccine, certain criteria were required. There are essentially three ways for this to occur. You need to either one, be approved as a MyCalVax independent vaccination program with the state of California, or two, create a working relationship with another MyCalVax recognized vaccination program or three, be approved as a MyCalVax vaccination program under the umbrella of the County Health and Human Services. So you might be wondering, what's MyCalVax? MyCalVax is a statewide centralized system for healthcare providers enrolled or interested in participating in the California COVID-19 vaccination program. This was originally known as COVID Ready, which began during the COVID-19 testing phases prior to the vaccines receiving approval for administration. This later transitioned to CalVax, and then finally, MyCalVax. So what does MyCalVax program approval require? Among many things, approval requires an approved vaccine storage unit, refrigeration, frozen, and low temperature freezing, integrated continuous temperature data logging technology, an approved training plan and qualifications, approved scope of practice for vaccine administration, and approved vaccine distribution plan. The fire agencies across the county used a variety of the three options. Most used option two, which was creating a working relationship with a MyCalVax approved agency. Cal Fire County Fire offered COVID testing prior to the vaccination process, and as such, they were a pre-existing registrant for MyCalVax. Cal Fire County Fire themselves operated under option three, mentioned earlier, an approved MyCalVax agency who is working in partnership with County Health. San Diego Fire Rescue and Carlsbad Fire Department were approved as independent vaccination programs and have the ability to operate as such or in partnership with County Health should the need arise. So now that you have some of the background and requirements, let's go back to December 10th of 2020. On that day, I received a communication from County Health asking if the fire service could help with the administration of vaccines. The thought behind this was to build the vaccinator capacity and provide mobile administration to populations who are homebound or unable to travel, providing greater equity in the distribution plan. Following the conversation with County Health, I contacted Chief Tony Meacham from Cal Fire County Fire and Fire Chief Colin Stoll from San Diego Fire Rescue. With a massive geographic location and the number of human contacts required, we discussed the importance of a regional effort and invited all fire agencies within the county to participate, understanding that we, the collective fire agencies, would be working under the authority of the county on a specific mission to distribute vaccinations to the approved and assigned populations within San Diego County. All fire agencies, including those working as part of what you probably heard, Operation Collaboration, provided vaccinations in a variety of delivery models. Our points of distribution or pods 
or scaled to match the current supply levels and mission tasks. The pod's vaccination numbers ranged anywhere from 50 to 1500 doses per day and all had the ability to scale up in daily administration should the vaccine supply increase. The distribution occurred at both fixed locations where members of the community either walked in or drove through, as well as mobile teams who delivered vaccinations to community members who were in long-term care, homebound, elderly, individuals experiencing homelessness, and agriculture workers, to name a few of the populations. The state authorized the opening of phases in tiers prior to the counties opening the same phases. This is because of the many differences from one county to the next up and down the state. Where the state had the ability to be very broad, the county had to take into account the population each phase and tier had within the particular county and weigh that with the supply of the, of the vaccine that had been delivered. After that, the county must then look at the available capacity to vaccinate the tiers as they open. And finally, take into account the compounding effect, meaning as additional tiers open, there is still the time specific return of the second dose administration for previously open tiers who received their first dose. As the county determined what phases were open, county health would assign specific eligible population to our fixed locations and provide specific assignments for our mobile teams to accomplish. I think everyone recognized the entire process was very complex and we all learned things along the way and would probably change a few things if we were to do it again. With that being said, there were some wonderful things that occurred. The relationships developed are priceless. The public health system partnering with fire agencies to accomplish a mission the likes of that the world has never seen before was a success. San Diego County should be very proud of what it, what it has done. County Health, all the county fire agencies, our hospitals, doctors, nurses, firefighters, paramedics, everyone involved should be commended for the exhaustive efforts put forth. We were fortunate enough to make serious progress as a county over the last six months to the point where the fire service feels comfortable to have a slow glide path on an exit of the vaccination front as we enter fire season. While our primary focus is now pivoting from vaccines and over to the impending fire season, we're happy to report that the collective fire service has administered over 95,000 vaccine doses with an additional approximately 40,000 doses that San Diego Fire Rescue participated in at Petco Park. So this concludes my presentation. And as a reminder, when we're ready for questions, uh, Deputy Chief Jason Malnerich from Cal Fire County Fire and Deputy Chief Chris Heiser from San Diego Fire Rescue are here for any discussion or any specific questions to their operations at the vaccine sites. Thank you. Great. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Chief Calderwood. We really, really appreciate that. And I, I know that there will be questions, so I'm glad you got your crew here. Uh, to answer any questions. And um, once uh, we finish with um, Mr. Uh, Tim Collins, he's a doctor with the Scripps Green Hospital. Uh, we will be following up with questions from members of uh, the committee. So I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Tim Collins from Scripps Green Hospital to give us his thoughts. Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be able to share some of our experiences uh, with you all today. I think um, my unique position is moving from, I, I would say, kind of a victim of COVID being our the first hospital in San Diego County on March 9th to have a COVID patient to being able to be on the offense of being able to run the Del Mar Fairgrounds, uh, Scripps Del Mar Fairgrounds vaccination super site. I think it's at least allows me to have both perspectives and feel a little bit better about what we've been able to do. Um, next slide, please. Um, I've got a high level presentation here. I won't take a bunch of time, but I'll share with you kind of our experiences and some of the lessons learned. I had mentioned uh, March 9th, 2020, we had a hospitalized patient who came in for surgery that actually converted to a COVID patient about three days into their stay. 
Uh, the, we were not prepared, to be honest with you. We thought that the first patient would come through our EDs, emergency departments, or our urgent cares, and did not expect it to actually happen and convert in the hospitalized setting. So um, when we responded, we knew that we had to operate as a system. And as you all know, uh, when we're looking at ICU capacity across the county and outside the county, we all knew that we would be overwhelmed and we came together to operate as a system, knowing that we would have to partner with our fellow uh, facilities, both within Scripps and outside Scripps. And I think the prior presentation really pointed to the concept of collaboration and partnerships. Had we not had an excellent working relationship within the county that was already pre-established, I think we would have been in a different place than we are right now. The regional presence of the healthcare systems, the providers, the county, everyone coming together, um, all of the electric, elected officials being able to step forward and advocating for a greater number of vaccines and for the prioritization of vaccinations really put us in a tremendously strong position, as well as the increased availability of protective personal equipment that has helped us as well. And then we had greater testing and then ultimately vaccinations that came as a result. Next slide, please. Uh, high level of the Scripps Delmar Fairgrounds site. Uh, it's in partnership with the Delmar Fairgrounds. We designed it to support up to 10,000 vaccines per day. Our goal was to make it efficient uh, and predictable for individuals that came on campus, both walk-ups as well as drive-ups that they would be on campus for only 30 minutes, being respectful of their time. And the access to the five freeway helped us out and, and allowed us to del deliver on that promise. Uh, we used the My Turn app, which we were one of the first ones to access that, which posed problems in itself being a beta site. Uh, we had challenges with some of the vaccine availability early on. Our target was 1 million vaccines, although we've only been able to do over 100,000, unfortunately, just based on supply, as I said, less than 30 minutes and accessible to the entire community. And I need to give a shout out to the North County Transit District who actually developed a routing service so that individuals would be able to use public transportation to get directly to the site. Next slide, please. Um, the site was really tapping into the Del Mar Fairgrounds expertise at managing large scale events. The flow was designed by them with some serpentine efforts to look at queuing the registration process to allow us to get individuals into the campus, onto the campus quickly, the vaccinations we used to experience clinicians to be able to support this, and then developed an observation process afterwards in case of any type of anaphylactic or allergic reaction to uh, the vaccines as patients proceeded through the, uh, the vaccination process. Next slide. Um, the lessons learned, I think, overall, with, with, with regard to the scheduling, we became more efficient over time, uh, and we were able to predict a bit more what the demand would be on a particular day. Um, we were able to operate about four hours a day, which allowed us to condense the planning and be very efficient, starting early for patients who needed to get to us before work. Uh, we've been able to deliver, like I said, over 100,000, um, and that has really been far-reaching within the county to all areas. We pulled in and made available uh, the, the vaccines to people traveling in from outside the county as well. We've had people from um, El Centro come in. We've had people from uh, South County, Chula Vista, et cetera. So we really feel like we've served the entire region. Um, the resources, again, we pulled in great expertise from, from all the folks and agencies that, that supported this and knew this type of business. Um, and then as we looked, as we proceeded down this pathway, um, we were able to manage the no-shows and cancellations more effectively. Um, one thing that's happened as of late is unfortunately a bit of apathy on, on the part of uh, patients that we would like to do greater vaccines, but we're seeing a marginal curve, a decreasing or a diminishing curve uh, on the growth factor on, on first dose vaccinations, unfortunately. Next slide. Um, these are just a couple pictures. This was high throughput is key to success. We designed it uh, with some of the recommendations from uh, individuals and organizations who had done this before with the intent of being able to mass vaccinate, knowing how difficult it was to do single doses, as we've heard from the CVSs and the Walgreens, very difficult, very expensive, higher waste factors. 
I'm pleased to say that we essentially had four or five uh, wasted vaccines every day just through the, the planning process that we had, and we always found arms for them. So our waste factors were, were minimal uh, based on the design that we had in place. Next slide, please. Uh, you can kind of see it, it was organized chaos with traffic coming through every day. Uh, predictable outcomes. If any of you had your vaccines at the center, you knew that when you, you drove through the parking lot, you would be in and out in probably less than 30 minutes. Uh, very efficient. We also managed anaphylactic shock. Um, we had different populations that came through. Um, we noticed that with each drug, with each vaccine, there were different populations that came through. Uh, we had a couple fainting episodes with the J&J &J products uh, based on people who had waited so long because they were afraid of needles. So they knew that it was only one shot versus two. So we had to manage the different populations that would come through. But overall, I think uh, our goal was to make sure it was efficient. Next slide, please. Uh, it really relied upon volunteers from the community. We had folks from, you had Rotary, you had local groups, you had schools, you had even uh, San Diego Sheriff's Department search and rescue came and, and supported every single day. And the sheriff's reserves were there every single day supporting us from a safety perspective. So again, wide community resources, everybody stepped up, creating a bright light at the end of a very dark tunnel for a lot of people. Next slide, please. Ultimately, our goal was to get a million shots in the arm. We didn't achieve that. Uh, we achieved over 100,000 and still continue uh, vaccinating. We had a session today. We have another one tomorrow and we'll continue. Um, but we continue to be just a resource for the community. And again, it wasn't Scripps Health doing this. It was the community and the volunteers. We listened to what the volunteers presented to us in terms of opportunities to be more efficient, to be more responsive, to be more focused on what the community needed. And it was a great opportunity for us to listen, learn, and be there for, for the folks that needed us. So um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to be here today and to share the experience we had. And I think on behalf of Scripps Health, it's, uh, it was a privilege and an honor to be able to serve. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Collins. We really appreciate you, uh, again, addressing the fact that you were on the forefront and from north to south, you realize uh, Scripps has really been at the forefront and uh, part of the leadership of helping to um, overcome this pandemic. So thank you for all of your work and all of the, the support team from the nurses to the doctors to the phlebotomists to everybody who has been on call <laughs> to uh, putting the solution or the, um, the vaccines, uh, uh, reconstituting them, finding those needles, making sure that the temperatures are okay. Uh, everything matters. So thank you again. Uh, so with that, uh, that concludes the formal portion of the presentations. However, we do have a couple questions that um, we would like our uh, panelists to uh, uh, you know, take in and potentially answer for us. And that way we can go into um, any comments or uh, questions from uh, members of the virtual dais here. But uh, starting off uh, for our panelists, what goals did you envision as we face this pandemic and how well do you think we uh, did achieving them as a region? And why don't we start with uh, Dr. Ramers and then we'll go um, down to the chief and then uh, Dr. Uh, Collins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I would start with the the goal was to really minimize loss of life and, and minimize our healthcare system becoming overwhelmed. Um, you know, 3,700 people have died in San Diego so far of COVID-19. So I, I wouldn't say it's a screaming success, but we, um, as the prior presenters mentioned, we reached new heights of, of collaboration, which I don't think, um, you know, I, I've worked in the last year with many people that I that are in very separate silos and you know, I talk to the county uh, regularly, probably twice, twice a week as a healthcare provider. That's a rare thing. Um, and this was, you know, facing such a huge problem like this, um, uh, it takes all hands on deck. And, and, and the examples that you heard, really, that was an amazing um, collaboration. I, I feel like we can use that to go forward and to, to strengthen our public health infrastructure. 
um, we wanted to just not be completely overwhelmed like other places had been like New York City and like um, Brazil and India currently are. Uh, speaking to the chief medical officer of the county, there were a couple of days where we were on the on the brink. We had hospitals refusing to take ambulances for a while. Um, and I think we thankfully made it through. Um, the goals is just to kind of get through it with minimal loss of life, to, to respond in an organized way as a society uh, and not completely tank our economy. I think we're going to be debating for years uh, whether we thread the needle in the right way. But now it's early enough after the, the surges are, are dying down that we can kind of take stock of how we did compared to our neighboring counties. And we have the highest vaccination rates of any other Southern California county. Um, we've had close to the lowest death rates of any other uh, county. So I think overall we did, we did quite well. Thank you. Uh, so I think that conversation and the cross-pollinization of many different organizations from the dentists to the, um, you know, folks who, again, uh, from the CVSs of the world, really all, all being on that front line. Uh, Chief uh, Calderwood, any thoughts on where we are um, in achieving the goals that you may have had at the beginning? Well, I think I think Dr. Ramers, hoped I pronounced that right, um, really answered the question perfectly. Um, the only thing I might add, which is really saying a lot of the same thing is for us, you know, our goal was to use our unique position to um, bend the curve. And you know, I think we did that. And I, I'm, I'm for one proud of not only the fire service, but the county. And, and as Dr. Raymer said, just the relationships that were created, it, it really took all of us. And we had to push everything aside and do everything that we could to get along and come up with a plan and execute that plan. And every, it seemed like every time we came up with a plan, something changed in the background, uh, whether it be uh, the sign-up system, the appointment system, we went through a couple different um, iterations of that. And th that always caused some complexities, but together we made our way through it and we did bend the curve. Uh, Tim, uh, and, and Chief uh, Calderwood, I, I really have to thank um, you know, the, the, the group for helping to really get our firefighters ready. And in particular, in my community, we were uh, certified by both the county, the state, um, and we've been pushing out vaccines like nobody's business. And, um, you know, to Captain Robinson and Chief Barra, we, you know, it really comes down to um, that fire in the belly that the, the firefighters have, and no pun intended there, but you know, the, you guys really um, have something that um, again is very much appreciated and you guys are trusted messengers as well. Um, so uh, Dr. Collins, uh, any thoughts of where you envisioned we'd be and uh, how well you think we've gotten there? Well, I, I think that uh, we had hoped naively that we would have been one and done when we saw the first bump uh, we were hoping that that was it and that we would be able to use the precautions that everybody endorsed. Uh, and unfortunately, we got uh, the, the second bump that was even greater. Um, so I think from our perspective, it was just to ride the wave as much as we could and to balance. Um, the challenge that we had was we, as Dr. Ramers had mentioned, uh, we were stretched overall and the ability to sustain that level was only done based on the regional approach. So I think we stand in a better place right now in the learnings. Um, I, I, and I think the other thing is there was no playbook. You could prepare for all these different elements. Um, the playbook had to be written and it had to be written by each one of us in a different way, but it fed, in, fed into a master playbook that I think the region and the, the county will benefit from next time. Right, and I, and I think that that sentiment that, that there was no 100% right answer because everybody was kind of pivoting and doing what they felt was right at that point in time, uh, whether it be your own enrollment system and computer platform to, um, you know, uh, I, I think the one thing that did come out well was the messaging of the masks once we started you know, getting, um, uh, well, the, the CDC and um, a number of other uh, federal and state organizations, I think here in this 
state of California, we were able to really push the, the mask message. It did take nine months. I mean, it wasn't overnight, <laughs> but uh, I think that was one consistent message. Uh, before I go into uh, the next question, I wanted to uh, open it up to members of the uh, committee to see if there were any questions for the panelists. Mr. Goble. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this question's for Dr. Ramers. Uh, I think the real story is breakthrough cases, or I should say lack of. Uh, the CDC came out today with updated numbers saying out of 125 million people in a country fully vaccinated, there have been less than 1,400 cases, national uh, hospitalizations, and uh, less than 100 deaths nationally that are breakthroughs. So I, I think, is your impression, as I look at it, this, as a group, these are very effective vaccines. We have been continuously surprised with how quick and how effective these vaccines have been, even in, in situations where we wouldn't expect that they would stand up, for example, to new, new variants and new strains coming in. The two, the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna have been exquisitely effective, very, very safe. And you're right, um, protecting very well. I think the numbers in San Diego are, it's a 0.02% risk of having an infection um, after you're fully vaccinated. So just incredibly effective. I, I do a lot of global work and around the world, there's a lot of vaccines from China and Russia that are being used and they're really not as good. Uh, you're seeing countries like Chile and the United Arab Emirates that are pretty good vaccination rates, and they're still having raging COVID epidemics because the vaccines just aren't as good as the ones that, that we're using here. Um, in a sense, we got lucky that the, the vaccines developed against the spike protein. It's an easy target that works really well with our immune system, but it, it wasn't really luck. It was 10 years of well-funded scientific research, um, a government that was willing to throw a lot of money <laughs> towards uh, developing these vaccines, um, and then the, the, the willingness of people to get them, uh, if I could lead into the next question um, a little bit, you know, one of the biggest and unexpected challenges is this vaccine hesitancy issue that we are really struggling with right now. Uh, and sometimes I just want to, I don't know what I want to do. I wouldn't say it in a form like this, but, uh, you know, I want to shake people and say, what are you doing? I've watched more than 25 people die in front of my face from this disease. And yet you're, you know, and you're not willing to do a simple step step that can protect you to take a vaccine. Um, uh, so, so very, very effective. Um, very, very few breakthrough cases. In fact, the only cases that I'm seeing in clinic now, we still have a monoclonal antibody clinic to treat people with COVID. The only people I'm seeing are those that are not vaccinated. Question: We're told that we might need to do this on an annual basis, much like other influenza shots. Uh, but this one, uh, and we've had higher vaccination rates with this than we have with the seasonal flu vaccinations. My question is, do you think we're going to need a similar brilliant effort when the time for boosters needs to come around? We're at a seasonal low here in summer. Uh, this one, we're going to see cases and things like that. Are we going to need this Herculean effort for boosters? It's a good question. I don't think so. Uh, and, uh, and that rests on the fact that these are very, very effective and we have a, a nice high baseline of population that is protected. We keep seeing more and more scientific papers that come out about how even just getting a, a, a primary series of Moderna or Pfizer is standing up against these new variants quite well. So the companies are going to be prepared. They're both developing you know, new versions of the vaccine with, with, that are targeted towards new strains and everything like that. But it may be that we've achieved enough of a reasonable herd immunity. You know, we're not at full herd immunity, but 50% right now, that the virus has nowhere to go, or it only has small pockets of people that it can infect. And it may be that, that we don't have this overwhelming major pandemic like we had before. Now, I've been in, in infectious diseases for about 15, 20 years. Every two to three years, there's another pandemic. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen again. It may not be a coronavirus, but, but there's going to be another a pandemic like this, I would bet my house on it. My final question for you is speak to the therapeutic currently available. If you do take team, the Regeneron, Kyle, and Desivir, other things, uh, how effective are they in treating COVID today than what we had a year ago? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it's been very um, disappointing that we haven't had something really easy to get out into pharmacies like a pill that you could just prescribe and, and, uh, and get people to not get too sick. 
So initially the uh, therapeutics came in the hospital and that's remdesivir and steroids. Those are definitely saving lives, but it's, it's more like taking a mortality rate from 25 down to 20%. So it's a marginal benefit there. By far the most effective therapy that we have is the monoclonal antibody group, which is the Regeneron and the Eli Lilly cocktail. But this has been kind of cumbersome for people to implement. Um, but having said that, the county as well as family health centers have, we each have two separate spots where if you, if you get diagnosed early enough and you test and you come in and you get um, seen, you can get a monoclonal antibody and that reduces your chances of going to the hospital by 80%. I mean, that is far more effective than most of what I do every day as a doctor actually. And yet there's not a lot of awareness out there. We, we've just recently gotten some federal funding to increase the, uh, the awareness in the community. And so there's ads that you'll be seeing going forward. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, we don't have an, an easy to use oral. Um, there's some hope that in the fall, we might have something a little bit better. Um, but yes, help me get the word out that people can be treated um, and avoid getting sick in the hospital. Great, thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, we now go to uh, council member Campillo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I don't have any further questions to add. I just wanted to thank the presenters and also uh, Chief Heiser, uh, City of San Diego. Appreciate uh, the firefighters taking care of my community of Linda Vista with a vaccination station at the Bayside Community Center a few weeks ago. Super important. Supposed to start at nine o'clock. We had about 25 people show up at 830. I think uh, two of those uh, spoke English. So uh, really taking care of a community that uh, needs to see more vaccinations. And, and so I truly appreciate you helping us there. And uh, Dr. Rammers, Dr. Collins and uh, Chief Calderwood, just appreciate all your efforts throughout the county because we know that you know uh, it's, it spreads communally across the entire county, irrespective of who you are. When we all take the freeway systems together and, and uh, go to church together and school together and really appreciate everything you've done to protect us all over the county. Thank you. Excellent. Are there any other uh, members of the dais that would like to ask a question? And I really felt that this was an important presentation and timely being as how we just hit our one year of, you know, the, the closures well, a couple months back, but you know, we're, we're, we're all seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with regards to that June 15th date. What does that mean? Uh, I guess uh, that would be one of the questions that I would like to ask, um, you know, for our, our panelists, how are you preparing for that June 15th uh, date? And, and again, it's it's one date in the calendar, but we know that it is, um, you know, for many people that uh, the next phase. So what are, what are you all uh, doing to kind of prepare for that? Well, I can start. We're trying to vaccinate as fast as we can because, um, you know, every time we open up and allow people to interact more Normally, uh, we've seen cases uh, bump, usually about two weeks after that. Um, and there are a lot of people still not vaccinated. You know, it's, it's hard to hold two separate thoughts in your head at the same time. We've done an incredible job. We're at about 50% fully protected amongst those are, that are eligible, but that's another 50% that aren't protected. And I see people every day in clinic that are very, very vulnerable with uh, diabetes or hypertension or obesity or immunocompromising conditions that just have in their head this hesitancy that they don't want to get it, that they don't trust the government who made it, um, that you know somebody told them there were microchips or something in it. And, and then just even today, just crazy rumors that get perpetuated on the internet. Um, anybody with a camera, with a webcam can look like an expert on a YouTube video. And that's, that's a really hard problem to fight against. Um, so the more we have vaccinated, you know, the closer we get up to 75% of the entire community vaccinated, the, the more protected we're all going to be. Um, so what I, I can kind of see this going two ways. Um, I think uh, it might have been uh, Tim that mentioned that, you know, that we are having diminishing returns at our vaccination sites that that's really discouraging because, you know, we need to keep this going and get those people that are on the fence in, because if we don't get there, we are going to have pockets and an additional community spread and additional outbreaks. That's bad for the people to get sick, but it's even worse for all the rest of us because we might have to sort of stutter step and then, you know, keep mask mandates or bring them back or have limits on uh, on mass gatherings and that kind of stuff. So um, that's kind of what I'm looking for is, uh, can we continue the push to, to get more people vaccinated um, uh, as that June 15th gets closer and closer um, and, and really you know prevent it from, from uh, lots of little pockets of, of outbreaks going forward? Great, thank you. Dr. Collins? I think our, our next step is we're, we're actually preparing for another spike um unfortunately because that's what we have to do 
uh, on the uh, Del Mar Fairgrounds. We, we're continuing to vaccinate. We stay open. Um, and uh, to Dr. Raymer's point, I mean, it's today we had 5,000 spots available to vaccinate individuals, and we got about 600 people showing up. And it's really sad because we are nowhere near where we need to be. Um, and so I think continuing to educate is what we need to do. And we're not done with this. And unfortunately, June 15th is going to open up. And I think people are a little apathetic with it and saying it's not going to happen to me. Um, but it can happen to any of us. And so I think continuing to get the word out, we continue to be very vocal about it. Uh, and we, we haven't really let our guard down either. I think we've left all of our structures in place to be able to support from isolation rooms and storing PPE and, and we're ready for the next wave if it comes. And, and you just touched on it, um, Dr. Collins, both, both of you, um, that it's education, but here we are almost six months in and we've been, do we've been doing education. What do we need to do? I mean, I, I know that I can speak with an I statement here. I've brought low riders out. I've gotten food, partnered up with food distributions. I've done it at familiar locations. I, I guess it kind of goes to question number seven. What can our region's elected officials do to support the public health efforts? Because education is only one component. And we've been doing it for the last six months. And I mentioned it took nine months for people to feel comfortable wearing a mask. Um, what, are we, what are we needing to do? Well, Mayor, I'll start. I think you know you you did it by leading by example and, and being very public about your opinions on a vaccine and um, bringing in your staff. Um, the one thing I think we haven't quite had enough of is, you know, people respond. I would love it if everybody listened to my advice, but the reality is they don't. Um, people listen to their cousins and their family and their you know whoever's on the Padres what they say uh, a little bit more. And so you know, engaging sort of our our you know, we like to say trusted messengers, but it's even more than that. It's our, our superstars, our, our athletes um, uh, in, in sort of, everybody has a different reason that's gonna convince them, you know? For some people, it's coming into my office and hearing that I and my daughter got the vaccine and saying, okay, well, if you've trusted enough to give it to your own family members, then yeah, I'll take it. But, you know, people don't always think the same way. They wanna see uh, Tatis get his vaccine on TV or something like that. So. Um, I think for elected officials, walking the walk and not just talking about it, getting yourself in front of the camera and taking the vaccine is really critical and important. Um, we at the, you know, I've been working with the county on the on the clinical advisory committee for the vaccine rollout, and and we have an outreach and education committee. But if we could get all the elected officials on board to really help push that forward, that would be great. Um, we haven't talked too much about some of the negativity and the controversy, but um, you know, local elected officials going against county rules and regulations is not helpful. We saw a little bit of that. Um, you know, this is a pandemic that's taught us all that it doesn't care your political affiliation. Um, it's gonna infect people in your community and, and you know, ruin your own economy. So just getting all, all together and all unified on the same message, I think is important. Um, and then, you know, all, all hands on deck and, and no wrong door. I, I love doing alternative sites and doing it at the, New Jersey. They're doing uh, shots and what do they call it? Shots and a chaser where they give you a free beer at a brewery. Yes. I mean, talk about an unlikely ally, but let's get our San Diego craft beer involved because they wanna be open at full capacity. They don't want outbreaks to shut down their business. That should be a, a no brainer to get them involved with helping us with vaccines. Padres as well, high school sports coaches. Why aren't they on board? They want, uh, they want their teams to play. They don't wanna to have to forfeit games because of COVID protocols. Um, these should all be our allies in getting the word out. And, and I can't, make everybody listen to me, but maybe they'll listen to their coach or maybe they'll listen to the brewmaster uh, who wants them to get a shot. Yeah, I, love I, would, I, I wanted to just uh, uh, add on a little bit. I, I think that electric, elected officials have a unique position to create partnerships. Um, I'll be honest, sometimes we don't see the broader picture. Um, you all have the ability to connect the dots and to bring out a greater cause and a purpose. And so I think pushing us to say, why can't we? Why couldn't this happen? Has helped us create new partnerships and collaborations that maybe before all of this, we didn't think were possible. So uh, being on that cutting edge of saying, why can't we do this? We gotta do this for the community. Um, keep doing that, keep pushing that. I think that sends a great message. It forces us to innovate. 
um, and have a different perspective and picture. And I would love it if there was a silver bullet in all this. I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, as Dr. Raymer said, the creativity on some of these things, bringing them forward, using every avenue and venue to be able to promote this and, and to push for greater clarity on the purpose. I, I, I love that. And I know that, you know, as elected officials, we, we do have that, you know, 5,000 foot level. And, you know, we, we sit on these regional boards and why we wanted to bring this, this you know, issue to the table so that my colleagues that sit on this uh, virtual dais with the Public Safety Committee uh, can also to share their insights and, and see that, you know, from you as the medical professionals and then with their colleague of the, of the fire chiefs, you know, you guys have been working on this for quite some time. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Rimmer's bringing up that the, the vaccine has, has been in the works, not necessarily for COVID-19, but it's been based off of scientific data based off of 10 years of research. This is not just a, you know, a six month turnover. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I would love to hear from my colleagues here, and in particular with uh, some of the chiefs, um, I would love to know how it's affected them in their, um, you know, public safety efforts, as well as some of the populations within the jail um, systems. And again, just really would love to hear that perspective. And, you know, maybe um, we'll start with uh, maybe Sheriff Gore. I believe we have Kay, Varso, and Conley. So uh, I hope um, you all are still here. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm there here. you are. I widened up my, my screen, so there we go. Sheriff Gore, if you want to go ahead. I've been waiting and, and patiently. Answer. No, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. It was very informative. Uh, you know, I, I look at it from two perspectives. Our impact it had on us on law enforcement, enforcing the public health orders, which were enforced to varying degrees around the state of California, around Southern California, depending on who the sheriff was, who the chief of police was. Uh, we tried to, to uh, balance between education and voluntary compliance and then writing citations, which same kind of the same like, position that my fellow chiefs did in the county. Um, where the biggest impact I think we had was in our jails. Uh, tremendous challenge there. We set up some early protocols, which I think uh, put us in, in really good stead. We got through up to when the when was the big outbreak in the community here, like November, December. Uh, we'd been running with two or three cases uh, uh, of COVID at any given time in our jails. What we set up as a protocol that when we didn't have enough tests to test everybody who's coming in, we started quarantining everybody, and we still do, <clears throat> but now we have tests quarantining everybody in our jails for up to seven days uh, before we put them out into the, uh, the general population. Now we have the vaccines. Uh, we have vaccinated every inmate we have. Uh, that will accept the vaccination. That's a challenge. Uh, we're running about 50% will accept the vaccine and about 50% accept being tested at intake. But our, our mandatory uh, <clears throat> isolation has, has done well. Can you hold one second? Sure thing. I hear, I hear a puppy that's, uh, that's yeah, growling. A little background noise there. <laughs> um, uh, in our jails uh, now, we're like I say, we're vaccinating everybody that will be vaccinated, which is about 50%. Right now, I think we have one case, positive case in our jails. Um, in the long term, we ended up having, I mean, we don't want anybody to die from this terrible disease. We had one death in all of our inmates as compared to RJ Donovan, which is about 500 to 1,000 inmates less than we have on any given day. They had 18 deaths. So I think our medical people, uh, the protocols they set up, the co uh, collaboration with county health, uh, we did a pretty good job. Um, we were very early with the PPE and on all things, which we continue to do. A challenge we have now as things open back up, we were doing a lot of arraignments and, and hearings in our courts uh, virtually. <clears throat> we set up cameras in our jail, so we weren't transporting inmates. The courts were closed. Now there's a push to reopen and uh, some of the lawyers want us to drag these people all over the county and get them into a courthouse for an arraignment. We're saying, let us do that 
uh, virtually like we've been doing, uh, especially during that seven day quarantine period. That's the time when these people are potentially uh, uh, contagious. We don't wanna be hauling them into a court of law uh, for an arraignment. So we're working on those details, but overall, I think it was, it was very trying, but I think we did a pretty good job. And uh, real quick, uh, Sheriff, what were some of those protocols that you put in place? Uh, I know uh, earlier was mentioned the face coverings, but uh, the arraignments that were being done virtually, what, what well, did that the look The main like? thing is, is so we brought our population down from 5,600 to a, a, a low, at the lowest point to 3,400 uh, by adjusting, by doing early releases, releases under my authority, by restricting the intake of inmates, which to me was not good public safety practices. There was people on the street that should have gone to jail, but it was a balancing act between keeping our population numbers down and, and public safety. So we're starting to modify those uh, booking criteria again. Plus we did social distance, we did extensive uh, cleaning in our facilities. We have a program to train inmates how to be uh, get jobs in the hospital industry in the cleaning field, and they can get certified in that area. So we use them, put them to good, good use throughout our system uh, cleaning. We had mass, our, inmates at Los Colinas, our female inmates down there, uh, made masks. So we had plenty of masks to hand out to all our staff and our inmates. <clears throat> and then the 70 quarantine, uh, which I think was a big help. Uh, vaccinations was, you know, and, and tests as they became available. So those are basically our protocols. It was like everybody else was doing, but it's a challenge as you can imagine. Jails weren't made to socially distance it. They're just not. And that's why we had to come from 5,600 to 3,400 in our jail population. Well, I think you've hit on one of the topics that um, as elected officials, uh, because everything is now virtual, uh, well, most things are virtual, you know, with public comment, with just the overall engagement with the community, uh, there is that question of how we move beyond, you know, whatever date that is that we go to the lower tier, are we going to keep certain things in place? And you know, if there's more efficiencies and effectiveness, and I think for the safety of others, um, you know, we've seen it through telemedicine, we've seen it through here, the courthouse, and even you know, our council meetings, we've gone through Zoom, and now people are able to give comments via phone, via online, in person or um, in writing. Um, so, are you? You mentioned that you're you're kind of making that ask. Who who has a jurisdiction over that? Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, a lot of lawyers right now. Uh, it's like herding cats. <clears throat> well, during the emergency uh, authority from the, uh, the, the state, it was easier to bypass some of these, these rules and regulations on who has to have a physically appear in a courtroom and who could do it virtually. The, 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 the right to waive that is with the inmate. And what we have found is most the inmates, it's much more convenient for them to be arraigned in it Los, it, it Los Colinas or downtown Central Jail instead of dressing out, going to get in a bus, going down to the courthouse, sitting in a big holding cell half the day just to go back uh, to their cell at, at Central Jail. So if we can do that virtually, they prefer it. But I think some of the, the, the public defenders and the defense attorney or the defense bar feel that they're not getting adequate time with their, uh, with their clients beforehand. Uh, they like the in-person instead of the virtual meeting. So those are the details we're working out. I prefer just from a public safety standpoint, the health standpoint, to stay with the virtual, especially on the, on the three-day arraignments when these people are in quarantine. That's, to me, it just doesn't make good public health sense. Thank you so much, Sheriff. I appreciate your, your insight. Um, if either uh, Kay, Varso, or Conley have any thoughts. Oh, there's Mr. Varso. Yeah, you know, the only thing I'll just add to the sheriff's comment, too, was just, you know, early on into this, one of those things that we were all working through, and it, all of our jurisdictions was making sure that at the end of the day, we, you know, while we're dealing with a pandemic, we still have 911 calls going on in our community, we still have um, crimes to investigate. So, um, you know, in our department, one of the things we were doing early on was setting up a, a schedule and a structure in a way that if uh, those of us that have, you know, the, the smaller law enforcement agencies that we still have resources to pull from if we happen to lose an officer that was sick. And then we had the quarantine issues as well. So that was one of the things that I think, at least in Escondido, ended up working out really well for us was 
that we built that structure in place that when we went through periods of somebody got ill or somebody got exposed to somebody, a lot of times, a lot of the quarantines were exposures at home even, uh, that we still were able to continue with our emergency operations and, and continuing to function as a city and provide emergency services in that way. So that's one of the things that kind of stood out to me throughout this whole thing. And uh, one last thing, since I have uh, the, the chiefs on, um, what could we do to improve um, as we move forward, um, you know, opening up? You know, I'll add to that. Um, you know, it, it took some time before uh, law enforcement met the criteria to actually get vaccinated. Uh, however, we were still required to go to work every day and, and uh, provide public safety. Um, and although we were getting some one-offs here and there, we did have challenges because we had uh, numerous officers that did test positive. And then once they test positive, um, you know, we have to look at who they worked closely around and, and taking into consideration, maybe quarantining some of those people and then putting those who tested positive through the quarantine pro uh, process. So, I mean, I think if we ever get into this situation again, it, it would be nice to consider um, getting public safety uh, vaccinated first because we, we are one of the uh, few professions that was out there every day still doing our job during this pandemic. So that was challenging. Great. Thank you. Definitely a lesson learned and plenty of dialogue around that one. Uh, Chief K. Um, I, <clears throat> Mayor, I've never met you in person, but I do want to thank you for being so outspoken about people getting vaccinated early on. Um, I, I, you know, being the smallest municipal police department in the county, um, we had some advantages and disadvantages. Um, we, you know, we were, we were doing things that I think the sheriff talked about, we're shooing people off the beach. And you think of the enforcement we were involved with, and at the same time, the dialogue about policing that hasn't ended yet about the kinds of things we should be doing, but we're out chasing people off the beaches. It just, I thought it was very interesting at the time. Um, one thing that uh, really struck me is at the beginning of all this, the information that we were getting painted a very bleak picture about the number of deaths we were gonna see and the, the, the numbers. And so we, we struggled. Um, I'm very fortunate. I got a great fire chief in Coronado to work with. Uh, the city manager, uh, very supportive of the public safety services here and recognized that, that he didn't want the cops being the tip of the spear on a lot of the stuff. So he was able to set up a uh, couple of layers of education and uh, admin enforcement and we were kind of the last resort. So um, very much appreciated that approach. And at the same time, the same issues with the other departments in terms of keeping our personnel healthy, figuring out how to, how to reorganize our workspaces to uh, reduce the exchange of uh, air between people. Um, and I will tell you, you know, the officers have been fantastic across the county, the deputies, but I, I know, you know, working in a mask Wearing a mask as a police officer or a sheriff really creates a barrier sometime of communication with our, with our community. And um, it's been really interesting to see how those, that mask wearing has played out with our interactions with the public. So are you wanting the mask with the, with the window? <laughs> yeah, I, know those I, exist. I, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, we, there's a, a new saying, you're smasking. You're smiling with your mask behind your mask or you're smizing, you're smiling with your eyes. So uh, I think all of those things uh, do come into play. Uh, Dr. Raymer, did you have a thought there? I was just gonna say, you know, there's been some early discussion about mandating the vaccine and um, it's a little premature right now because the vaccines are not formally approved by the FDA, but that's coming very shortly. I think Pfizer is going to plan on getting their full approval within a month or two. And look, I am obligated to get a flu shot every year. And if I don't, I have to wear a mask for six months. Um, so really the trade-off between vaccines and masks is, is that easy. If you don't like wearing a mask, get a vaccine. And very soon we might be in the, the, the kind of a world where you're not allowed to go into certain buildings. You're not allowed to participate in certain businesses or travel unless you have a vaccine. And if you refuse it, then employers are within their rights to say, okay, fine. You either take a test every day up your nose or you wear a mask for six months. Um, I think we're getting very close to those kind of very real trade-offs. Agreed. Uh, Chief uh, or Sheriff Gore, any last thoughts regarding to some of the challenges we've overcome in this last? 
No, I thanks. I, I, again, I thank our presenters. Um, it was frustrating, as the chiefs have pointed out, not getting our own employees vaccinated uh, when we're out there every day as first responders. That was a big challenge. We had, I think, a total of about 700 employees end up being uh, you know, testing positive. We had one death of a professional staff employee in the sheriff's department. Um, of course, it, it, it sometimes being old has its advantages. I qualified uh, to get it, you know, without just without being a cop, just being old. So that's that's uh, the seniority gave you that that front of the line pass. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Sheriff. And um, you know, one of the things that I would love to ask uh, Dr. Ramers and uh, Dr. Collins and um, you know, Chief Calderwood, as we start getting ready to wrap up the presentation is, how do we make sure that we have people that are actually vaccinated that aren't like fingers crossed behind their backs? So oh, yes, I took the vaccine because it's, it is requirement, as you mentioned, for certain colleges to get on domestic flights or international flights even. Uh, I've, I've heard of on the black market, there are those you know, the, the vaccination cards that people are selling um, so that they don't have to. What, what would you say, you know, to kind of make sure we, we police that as well? Um, you know, well like, like, like the chief from, from Coronado mentioned, you know, I think law enforcement should be the, the last resort for this kind of thing. We should encourage people to want to get vaccinated. Um, when you think about schools and businesses, they they will have an easier time being able to enforce this. You know, it, it's we do it with vaccines all the time with kids. It's not going to be any different that you're required to have your measles vaccine and your meningitis vaccine to get into school. Um, uh, you're pretty soon going to be required to have COVID and you may have a, an exemption written by a physician. But to be honest, there's really not any contraindications to getting this vaccine. It's so safe. Uh, likewise, businesses, especially airlines, are going to be able to enforce this and say you need to show this. I mean, we're seeing it this summer, Lollapalooza, a giant massive concert in Chicago is requiring proof of vaccination to get in. Oh, and wow. If you don't have proof of vaccination, you have to take a test every single day that you go. Um, so on the individual sort of business unit uh, scale, I see this as being easier to manage. When you're out in public though, you know, we can't really enforce this in public. And this is why people are being very cautious about this June 15th date, because, you know, for, you, you just can't, people say it's my own private health information and, and that's partially true. You're not allowed to really uh, ask in detail unless you're engaging in a transaction. So, um, you know, I think just encouraging more and more, getting more percentage of the population vaccinated. And then, and then again, businesses are within their rights and schools are as well to not permit people to enter unless they can prove it. I, I, think, I think that that is probably the million dollar or, or larger question is how will this be enforced? And I think as an organization, we're trying to figure that out right now. Um, as Dr. Raymer said, uh, within healthcare organizations, you are required to either be vaccinated or to wear a mask. Um, our challenge is how far do we go with that? Um, and then our other challenge is great. We know that you're in an environment here, but what do you do outside of work? And all of that is a challenge. Uh, and to, you know, I think we all have a personal responsibility on this. It's making that clear to individuals that they have a personal responsibility as well, and driving some accountability around that. I love it. I love it. Chief, uh, I keep wanting to call you Calderon, but Calderwood. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I, I grew up with a lot of friends calling me Calderon as well. So. <laughs> um, well, I certainly like both the answers that you already received. And um, definitely those decisions are above, above my pay grade as a fire chief and leave it up to the doctors and the legislatures to decide. But similar to what was mentioned for the fire service, we do provide emergency medical care. And as such, we work under the authority of the county EMS agency. And we also have the requirement where if we don't have a flu shot, uh, we have to wear a mask. And I see this going down that same path. Uh, it protects our people and it protects the people that we're serving. Great. Well, as a person who has been vaccinated, participated in the vaccine trial, has a husband who's vaccinated, who my little girls are wanting to get vaccinated, they're still too young. Um, but I, I'm going to be wearing a mask and, um, uh, you know, it allows me not to have to wear lipstick 
you know, if I don't choose, you know, feel like wearing it. But I think it also too, for me, just gives me that added sense of security. You know, nobody's gotten sick with the cold. Nobody's gotten sick with the flu, which has actually been really cool. Um, I'm sure the, the Kleenex market doesn't like that, but uh, for, for us, it's, it's keeping us healthy. Um, so to that end, um, I wanted to give a last opportunity for our panelists to give closing remarks, any other um, pieces of advice that you can give us as elected officials, as people within the public safety uh, community, um, and those colleagues that are you know, watching online. Um, I think it's really important. This is your platform to, to share any last messages if you, if you have them. Um, Dr. Ramers? Yeah, I'll start. I, I mean, I, I kind of got my thoughts on paper in a, in a, a Union Tribune. And, uh, let's just run out. Uh, editorial and the main messages for me are just you know infectious diseases um, whether it's HIV or tuberculosis or other things they they serve as a big mirror to our society and, and you know this COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that people uh, that are more vulnerable in our society are going to suffer a lot more and it's just not as easy of them for them to take care of themselves or to protect themselves and then those that are, have money and power and influence are going to use it to sort of try to get first in line. And this vaccination effort has really shown us that. And yet, with an infectious disease, uh, you know, we're not. None of us are safe until we're all safe. Um, we have. It's you know, we all share the air together, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if if just a, a certain number of people are vaccinated, because those that aren't vaccinated are still going to be risk for our entire community going forward. Um, I just wish we would kind of drop, I mean, everybody is, their nerves are fried. I haven't taken PTO since last year myself, and um, and we're all a little bit uh, short-tempered and everything, but when it comes down to it, we're in it together, and, um, and you know, on the bright side, we've really banded together, uh, many organizations working together to try to get past this, and thankfully, we're almost there. Um, you know, I just wish that we could take this type of, uh, of solidarity and spirit um, for some of the other tough problems that we have like homelessness and drug use and um you know lots of other things um uh, but it's it's nice that we've almost made it through yeah well thank you thank you for that dr dr Collins. and then uh, we'll I, wrap I, it up with Calderwood. i think it's uh, it's an echoing of what dr what, what what was just said i i think that we have taken a huge step forward working together in partnership we can't lose that. We should only take steps forward. Um, and so I think being able to use this as a great example of what we can do and what we can be uh, really will create the platform for the future. So it's, it's I think you celebrate a little bit. Uh, we also know we have a long way to go. Very true. Chief? Yeah, I'll echo those, those same comments. Um, in, in addition, I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to let the fire service um, be a part of this and um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. While we are phasing out as we get ready for fire season and I'll take the moment for a shameless plug, <laughs> please make sure you have defensible space around your homes and try and refrain from any activity as we enter fire season that would cause a spark including um, chains dragging from your vehicles while you're towing. Um, but just because we're phasing out of the vaccination process and back into fire season, which is our primary responsibility, it doesn't mean that we're not still gonna be here. And if there's a need, um, we'll, can, we'll maintain the relationships that we've established so strongly through this and um, in any way that we can, we'll be there to help again. But again, thank you. Excellent. Well, I love the leveraging of your platform here. Get as many messages out as possible. This is why we're having this. Uh, truly, thank uh, staff, thank you, Dr. Berg, thank you, Dr. Collins, Dr. Ramers, and uh, Chief Calderwood for uh, being here and sharing your insight. We know that we're still in this pandemic, even though some people may not see it day in and day out, you, you are there at the front lines, and we thank you for your, your service and your commitment to our community. As elected officials, um, you know, I'll, I'll use an I statement, I like using I statements. I will be there to help push that envelope, whatever and however I can. And um, I know that I'm not alone uh, in that. There are many of my colleagues who feel the same way. And uh, whatever we can do, please let us know. Um, and we'll, we will keep pushing that envelope. Uh, you, uh, Dr. Ramers uh, alluded to, uh, you know, 
addressing issues of homelessness and the unsheltered and a multitude of other issues. And today we did actually take down the encampment, um, the 805 uh, freeway and 16th street. And I wanna give a special shout out to um, CHP, National City PD and uh, Caltrans who was out there uh, doing that. Um, because when we have that type of scenario, we know that there's um, potential hazard for more COVID-19 transmissions uh, as well as other communicable diseases. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, before we officially close, I'd love to ask uh, the city clerk if there are any other uh, comments from members of the public. No, Terry, I don't see any hands from the public. Any other comments from the virtual dais here, members? Seeing none, I uh, want to give the last reminder that this is Bike Anywhere Week. So, uh, Dr. Rivers, is that a bike that I see behind you, or is that just a... That's, that's my bike. Yay! I ride to work every day. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, give him a shirt like Oprah. You get a shirt, and you get a shirt, and you get a shirt. Um, we want to encourage everybody to have the opportunity to bike anywhere, whether it be to work or to the beach or to uh, the grocery store. If we're able to get out of our vehicles and onto the street, not only do we recognize what some of the hazards are, but we also get to enjoy some of the beauty that is um, here in San Diego County, the, the beautiful flowers, nature, and get that fresh air that many of us, um, you know, with COVID-19 being in, in the house or you know, distance learning, may not have had access to. So we're really encouraging you, get out, bike anywhere. If you sign up, you might still be eligible for a t-shirt and some other swag uh, from the Bike Anywhere Week for through Sandag. I wanna thank you all for joining us. The next Public Safety Committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, June 18th, 2021 at 1 p.m. This meeting is now adjourned.